What's the Church of Scientology so afraid of? This, this is SPTV. Welcome back, everybody, for more SPTV, where every day is a bad day to be David Miscavige, and every day is a great day not to be in a cult. Um, welcome back, Mark Headley. Hey, guys. Good to see everybody. Um, we are live streaming to both channels, so uh, you can get your SPTV entertainment wherever you choose. Um, oh guys, we're here to talk about some shit we didn't even remember occurred. <laughs> that's that's one hundred percent the case. <laughs> okay, so I got an email from someone who I won't name for now, who said, "Hey, do you remember this Scientology training film starring Jason Begay, where uh, Jason Begay's character is?" Uh, rescued from like an asteroid he was stranded on by a spaceship that had a Scientologist a Scientologist chaplain on board and and Jason Begay's character after being rescued he was like so uh, he had so much like anger and PTSD right and the Scientology chaplain goes do you want I should give you an auditing session and I'm that's the first time I was like who speaks like that but that's how yeah. it was scripted do you not, want not only who speaks like that who speaks like that in space <laughs> <laughs> they just pick this dude up and it's like hey you want a session <laughs> yeah. do you want i should give you an auditing session is exactly how he said it anyway and, and, so i get this email and it's like do you remember in the session it, it, by the way the film is called the session yeah and it and it's a it's a, in scientology it's an internal um what they called training film and they had TR films, training films, and then they had E-meter films, which were also training films, but they were um, uh, E-meter centric. And this was a TR training film, and it was number 13, and it was TR 13, The Session. And these are films that are used to train auditors. Um, you can't just walk into an organization and ask to see one of these films. You can only see the film if you're enrolled on that specific auditor training course. And what was crazy about this film is that, uh, you know, the, the plot twist at the end is that Jason Begay's character wasn't actually suffering from so much PTSD because of what had been done to him. The auditor got to the core of what is it he had done himself? What was he guilty of? And it turns out he had pulled a Danny Masterson on one of his crewmates. Yeah. And now this film was written 100% by L. Ron Hubbard. The dialogue, the ang camera angles, the entire thing is written and um, created by L. Ron Hubbard. And, and essentially, you want, can, can I just tell the, the story? Yeah. Okay. So we shot this film in um, uh, at the in the San Bernardino uh, Valley, I guess you would call it. It's uh, it was at Norton Air Force Base where we had a studio at the time. It was before we had built that giant castle studio at the international headquarters at, at Golden Air Productions at the IT base. Um, and we were shooting this film at Norton Air Force Base in this giant hangar. And uh, a bomb-proof hangar, by the way. It's where um, they used to uh, have like a nuclear button in there, and it was literally a bomb-proof control center for uh, the Air Force. And um, we were shooting the film with Jason Begay, and there's a few other people in the film, and that is um, a guy by the name of Michael Wiseman, who is a, a Scientology actor, and another girl by the name of Caroline. I can't remember her last name at, at, at the moment. I know her married name, but we'll save that for the end. Um, but um, the story in the film is that Jason's character, Jason Begay, um, who used to be a Scientologist and was an actor, a very um, uh, prolific actor in uh, TV and movies. And um, his character is doing a spacewalk and his friend or what used to be his friend closes the airlock and, and cuts his thing and is like sayonara. And then um, Jason drifts to a nearby moon or planet or something like that. And he's basically stranded there and then they take off the, the, the spaceship takes off. Okay. Where the film starts is that he has just been picked up by like a, a, a rescue craft or some kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, was, he, was he broadcasting a distress signal? No, I I don't, nothing. I, that's why I don't want to get too deep because it's just uselessly stupid. Like this rescue craft just happened to be, I guess, flying by and they saw him or 
he like shined a mirror at him or something. I don't know how that works in space. Anyway, so he flags them down. They pick him up, and he's he's very um, upset um, that he was stranded on this moon. For he's like day. talking to himself, you know. <laughs> he's very riled up. He's and like you say, he, I don't know that. Yeah, well, I guess if you get dumped on a, an abandoned moon, uh, that that could count as PTSD. I guess that is post traumatic stress that he is experiencing, and um, and the main character is this. Uh, Scientology chaplain, and that's played by Jack Armstrong. And Jack Armstrong also was a Scientology um, actor, a, a Scientologist who was also an actor. And I um, mean, he had been in lots of tech, uh, technical training films um, that we had produced in uh, Golden Era Productions for Scientology. And so had Jason. Jason was also a favorite of David Miscavige to be in in, in these films and play parts in these films. And so um, he he does say, uh, "Hey, do, would, would well, I don't remember what you said, but it is like that. Uh, uh, should I give you a session or whatever it is? What do you, what does he say again? Do you want I should give you an auditing session? Do you want I should give you an auditing session? Yeah. And now this is a funny thing because there was a lot of times when we were shooting L. Ron Hubbard films. L. Ron Hubbard wrote all this um, dialogue, and it's from L. Ron Hubbard's time, and people don't talk like that." <laughs> And so there's a lot of things in there. And in this film, this comes up a few a few points later on as well. But essentially, he's getting a session. He's like, hey, these guys dump me on the planet. Arr. And uh, and and the auditor is like, well, what did you do? And that's how that's pretty much how it is in Scientology. If something happened to you. Um, it's not because you were the victim. It's because you were up to nonsense. And that's why that happened to you. So he's asking him about this and he's like, nothing happened, nothing happened. And he's telling him all these other things that aren't things that he did. And they go throughout the film and, and, and you basically hear the story about how Jason was friends. I think his name was Trimbo, if I re remember correctly. His friend's name was Trimbo. And Trimbo, played by Michael Wiseman, him and uh, Jason were great buddies. And they were, uh, you know, they were like space cowboys or whatever you want to call it. And they would d d do stuff in space together and they were good buddies. And then at some point, uh, Trimbo's girlfriend and Jason were were getting together and getting friendly. And then I can't remember Jason's character's name, but Jason char Jason's character essentially gave her poppers and some downers and then had his way with her. And because of this, uh, her, her, her current boyfriend, Trimbo, that's, that's definitely non-bro code activity. And that's when you get spaced. When you have your way with my girlfriend, next time you go on the airlock, sayonara. Um, now the crazy thing about this is that when we were shooting the film, the girl Caroline, who was playing the part of Trimbo's girlfriend played by Michael Wiseman was complaining uh, uh, was complaining vocally to the makeup and hair people that she did not like this Michael Wiseman guy. Uh, Michael Wiseman, by the way, if the name sounds familiar, his father is Bruce Wiseman, very famous science, uh, Scientologist who wrote a lot of books about psychiatry and how it's it uh, is not good and they are the e the evil uh, they basically work for Xenu, if you if you follow along that whole story. Psychiatrists were brought to Earth from whatever planet they were on, nine weeks light time from light years from here, and um, so they're not bad. So they're not good. Um, the, Michael Wiseman is Bruce Wiseman's son. Now, um, so Caroline shooting this, we're shooting these scenes with Caroline and Michael, and she's complaining full time. Blah 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 blah. Also, Jason, Jason's um, character has his way with her, and then that kind of messes things up between her and Trimbo. And I think their relationship fall, fell apart after that, unfortunately. Um, but later on, Caroline, I, I can't remember her name. She was Jenna Elfman's makeup artist, uh, or hair, hair, hair stylist, and also um, like did acting work 
here and there. But she ended up getting married to Michael Wiseman after we shot that film, which was the weirdest thing. Because she, I mean, could be one of those things where you're like, oh, I don't like him. And then, you know, you have little f flirty fights and stuff. Maybe it was something like that. But, um, but yes, when you asked me about this and sent me an email and said, hey, do you remember that film where like somebody was drugged and then they were assaulted? And I was like, what is he talking about? And then I was like, um, and then he said, oh, in space. And I was like, oh, yeah, we did shoot that film. I remember that. And it's exactly what happened. Well, it's funny because <laughs> when I got this email, I was like, I've seen this film like 20 times. Yes. And I remember everything about the film except for the crime. Yeah. And, and I emailed Claire and I'm like, Claire, do you remember this being the big crime in the film? And and she's like, oh, you should ask Mark. I'm like, Mark, do you remember this? So even you at first were like, no. I was like, this is crazy. And then I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That that's sort of the that is the that is that's the crescendo moment that he's like, oh, I remember. It was me. I did this to him, and that's why he spaced me. <laughs> and more details are coming back to me as well. If I recall, it's one of these things where it's coming off in layers. And at first. At first, you think it's a big reveal that he admits that he had an affair with uh, Trimbo's uh, girl. And then you think that's the big thing, but he doesn't experience enough relief. And so the auditor keeps digging. And then it's like, oh, you didn't have an affair. Yes. You drugged her. Yes. And that's when Jason Begay's character, you know, he, you know, he has this come to Jesus moment and he's crying and he's he's experiencing all this emotional relief from having unburdened himself. And here's the remarkable thing about this film. What what's the result of him admitting to drugging and raping his friend's girlfriend? What happens once he unburdens himself? They, they fly off and they're singing songs and bounding on tables and yay. Yeah. No one goes to jail. No one goes to space jail. No one tracks down this victim and finds out what her <laughs> end of this is none of that it's literally they sing a song we're homeward bound that's right we're homeward bound <laughs> that's right and actually jason begay's character says i'm gonna go off and i'm gonna find her and trimbo and i'm gonna get them some auditing yes that's exactly it's this is like there's no, and this is, this is L. Ron Hubbard's version of what uh, an all Scientology world would be, even up in space. If if you run into somebody who happened to, you know, assault and drug your girlfriend, um, as long as they get some auditing, everybody's going to work, at, everything's going to work out just fine. And oh, I'm trying to think, we've done other films um, with similar kind of storylines. Uh, there's, I think there's a nut. What's the other one? It's the angel Confe one. Confessional TRs. Yeah, and that's TR fourteen. And, and that's that, arguably one of the best produced films, in my opinion. Yes, that was a very, a very, very high production value for Golden Air Productions. We, yeah. we went all out on that one, and we also used some really, really good um, actor and actresses, and. Jeffrey Lewis is in that one too. He plays the um, the farmer. old man, the farmer. The farmer, yeah. But um, we had a devil who was not a Scientologist. He was a very good actor, not a Scientologist. He was great. The criminal that we had, the guy who goes to hell. Yeah. Oh, well, the story of that film is that this guy ends up in hell and he's like, hey, why am I here? And before he is like, um, what do you call it? Before he's... Um, uh, He's like in purgatory, sort of. Yeah. No, 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 no. He's already in hell, but the angel goes down there to bring him up to heaven. That's right. There, he's he's almost being admitted to hell, and the angel, an angel, and the devil are negotiating on how he's gonna either go to hell or she's gonna bring him to heaven. And the devil says, "Well, if you can get him to reform, then you can take him." But that's you know that's not likely. It's never happened before. But um, if he, and if he doesn't ref, if he's not reformed or he's not cured of being evil, then he's coming with me. And um, and the and I, I use this line all the time. The devil has this one line. He says, "The road 
What does he say? He says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And punishment is a vital deterrent to wrongdoing. <laughs> and, then, and then she goes, there's more than one school of thought on that subject. Yes. <laughs> the funny thing is that um, the angel is played by an actress by the name of Katie Mitchell. And Katie Mitchell was in a lot. She was in the Problems of Life film, which is like a public film that's shown uh, outside of Scientology to get people in. And she was in a bunch of other things. But when I first escaped from Scientology in 2005, I'm watching TV and I see this Chantix commercial, which is a drug. And and, and it's it's her. And I'm like, oh, she's so not in Scientology anymore. Because it's was either she, was it's made by Pfizer. When she was doing the films? Yes, she was 100% a Scientologist. And she was actually married to Jeffrey Tambor for a little while. No. Who yes, who ran the Beverly... He was one of the acting coaches at the Beverly Hills Playhouse. Wow. And so during that time, I think kind of Jeffrey might have been loosely, at least through the Playhouse, he was involved in Scientology and Milton Castaeus. But... Um, but uh, Katie was also, and she, I think I think we might even be friends on Facebook now. She is no, she has no involvement in Scientology these days. Well, she but, she plays one of the most historic um, figures in Scientology's technical training films. Yes, and, and and you're mentioning Confessional TRs because it's another. There, there's only two films in Scientology that center around the procedure of delivering a sec check, doing a sec check, uh, getting someone uh, the interrogation style Scientology auditing, and both films have as their message essentially no matter how bad the crime is once it's been resolved in a scientology auditing session it's been resolved there's nothing more to be done that's 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 all that's necessary for ethics and justice to have been served is you handled it with scientology auditing now in the session film you know the crime was drugging and raping a woman in confessional trs the crime was killing a woman yeah, he killed. Yeah, he killed. Yeah, he he did. That is he what happened in the film. Accidentally killed a woman with his car, and and he'd never taken responsibility for it, and that's why he was in hell. And the angel, who's a Scientology auditor in the film, by getting him to confront and accept responsibility for having killed this woman, he goes to heaven. That's it. That's all that's needed. Yeah, there's no police. There's no investigation. There's no, there's no, the, nothing. Yeah, you know what? I'm trying to think. We did shoot a lot of films that had police in them, but mostly they were ticket. They were getting tick, giving tickets out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, there's, um, we could do a deep dive on this. I, and I want to say before we forget, I did also sec check somebody in a film. Um, and that was the doll film. TR6, Use of a Doll in Auditing and TRs. And that's the film that we shot with Danny Masterson. Right. And in that film, um, I and I didn't realize this, and we may have talked about this in another video. He does that in that film too. He, Danny Masterson is a drunk doll. That gets other dolls drunk oh. and then parties with them. Oh. Yeah, it's a little bit of additional sick, twisted irony that Danny Masterson ended up doing exactly that to his co-star in that film. I'll just call her Robin that played the other doll in the movie. Danny, Danny raped his co-star in that film. And that was like 1993, 1994. It was early. Yeah, we shot that film in, yeah, 1993 or 94. And he was very young. The only thing that he was famous for then was being on the cover of a dictionary. He was on the uh, cover of Webster's Young Readers or something like that, or Young Adults. Or, but, um, but yeah, he was young, and she was very young too at that time. I want to say, I want to say they were both teenagers. I'm going to err on the side of um, them they being were. either <clears throat> either late. Uh, early 20s or late teens, eight, 16, 17, 18, 19, somewhere in there. Yeah. So my version, you know, uh, this is all coming second or third hand, is this was before he'd started using GHB. And he basically just got a young girl really drunk to the point where she couldn't consent and, uh, you know, did what he did what he did. Now, that person's never come forward because she's still in Scientology. Yeah. But it was a big deal for those 
it was a big deal even in the Masterson family. It would get brought up all the time. It wasn't like, oh, just something, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. And it was and, a big problem. You know, I wonder, now that I'm thinking about it, that's that she might have been number one. Yeah. And that was the plot line of the movie he was in. So are we going to, could we, you could speculate that he got that idea from the film. It, because that's what happens in the film. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's it is kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy that that exact plot line is in two separate films. It is crazy. That L. Ron Hubbard wrote. And also, um, if you believe some of the stuff that's been written about L. Ron Hubbard, when he was doing stuff with um, Crowley, is it Crowley or Crowley? Crowley is how they like to say it. Crowley. Um, they're doing a lot of drugs and, uh, and, uh, you know, personal activities in that, uh, kind of research yeah. research. So I think it called yeah. it, he calls it, L. Ron Hubbard called it research. Yeah. So one of the things that's just anecdotally interesting about these plot lines in these films is that it goes, it goes hand in hand with Scientology's policy of never involving the authorities in anything whatsoever for any reason. I mean, these are training films used to train Scientology auditors. And in one film, a guy admits to drugging and raping a woman. And in another film, he admits to killing a woman. The authorities are never involved. Scientology's saved this person. This person is now spiritually free. There's no need to involve the criminal justice system. And, you know, since Scientology's made such a big deal lately about denying that there's any practice or much less policy about not involving the police. You're like, it's in your technical training films. Okay. I'm going to tell, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to survey. Cause I've been asking tons of people this. Yeah. Okay. You were, how long were you in the Sea Org for? How many years? Well, the Sea Org proper only four years, but if you okay. want to count flag seven years. Okay. In seven years, how many times did a Sea Org member call the police? No, I mean, zero. Yeah, at the base, never happened ever once in 15 years. And the funny thing is, is that, oh, we don't dissuade people. And But okay, but here's another thing. In the Sea Org, how many physical assaults did you either witness or that you were directly there when it happened? Like, or you heard about it, you saw it happened? A dozen. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Like, you could, they, you, could, you could go like, oh, yeah, this guy and this guy, this guy and this guy. But no one ever is dissuaded from calling the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, people are beating the crap out of each other. And most of them are executives. So like if you were in the real world, it would be like, oh, you can't do that. You you can't be someone's boss or work with somebody and then just, you know, go toe to toe because you guys are disagreement that your, uh, your, your uh, what is it? Your purchase order didn't go through right. financial planning. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they want to talk about the policy. I mean, there's a flag order written by L. Ron Hubbard that says if two Sea Org members were to come to blows and one of them were to be seriously injured, perhaps there would be a charge of, you know, a, 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 a making it so that someone couldn't do their post. But perhaps there would be a Scientology offense that you hurt the guy so bad he couldn't keep doing his work for Scientology. But even then, there's no mention of involving any of the authorities. No. That's and that's the other thing. If you just look on his policies, he talks mad smack about mad trash about the police, government, um, the court systems, um, the FBI, the CIA, um, the the pr pr d d whoever was the president at the time or recently. There's nowhere where he's like, absolutely, we should get the police involved. That does not occur in Scientology policy. Mark, here's a question about Danny's character in the use of a doll in auditing in TR's film. Did Masterson's character in the movie do auditing and get away with it? Do auditing? Well, well, the... sec checking and auditing is more or less the same thing for the purpose. Oh yes, one hundred percent. That that is um, that is essentially what happened in the film. Is that unfortunately I'm the one who saved Danny in the film because there's this big investigation. That, that's the. Plot okay. twist. I'm so, the one who saved him. <laughs> correct my memory. Yeah. Uh, in the film, Danny Masterson's character gets declared and they're trying to fix the injustice. And so he basically comes clean about everything that he really did. And the injustice gets lifted. He gets undeclared. Well, Am because, I right? 
Yes, because I come in and I sec check everybody and I find out that there was a supervisor there and the supervisor knew that Danny was in trouble and that he was he was boozing it up. And the supervisor is the one that was pushing the booze on him and the other doll so that they would go off and get up to nonsense when they got all liquored up. And he was also the, the supervisor was the one that put um, the doll when you're in Scientology and you're practicing doing auditing, you practice with a doll, you audit a doll. And so um, the executive director was practicing auditing with Danny and because Danny was all always drunk and up to nonsense, somehow he messed up the executive director. And so I ask this guy, did you, were you the one, I, I remember the lines to this day, were you the one that put Gringy on the ED? And, and uh, the, uh, cause the auditor, Tate Rupert was the auditor that used Danny and he was a bad auditor. Right. And Tate Rupert was the one that was auditing the executive director. And, and the so, executive director got sick and was like dying from yes. that auditing. Yeah, so Gringy, which was Tate Rupert's character, I asked the supervisor, were you the one that put Gringy on the ED? And then he confesses that he was the one who did everything. And so then I write an SP declare on the supervisor, and then I cancel the declares on, the doll's name is Captain Jack. And the, the girl's name, the blonde doll, who was played by Robin, um, her doll was called Goldie. So it's Captain Jack and Goldie. And uh, shout out to Goldie. Hey, Goldie. Um, uh, anyway, d different Goldie. Completely different Goldie. Um, anyway, but then, um, yeah. So then when that happens, and that's the end of the film, he, uh, uh, Captain, uh, Captain Jack confesses to everything he did, but also we find out who really did do the thing that was, was being investigated and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, these and we weren't allowed to change any of these things in the, for the most part. If L. Ron Hubbard wrote it a certain way, we had to shoot it exactly that way. Even if it was super cheese, um, the way it was kind of written or uh, framed up or whatever, we just we had to match it and uh, do it exactly what Hubbard said. Right. All right, let's tackle some of these super chats here. Um, Elsie, what crime is too much for Scientology to keep its mouth shut about? Murder um keep their mouth shut about no if someone if someone actually admitted to having committed murder in an auditing session they would still not inform the police yeah i don't they I might mean, kick them off lines but they would not inform the police yeah that well that's another great thing about i was gonna say when um there's through all these osa files that we found you see a lot of things that are coming up. And that James Barber one that you did the other day, we just happened to find that document by accident when we were looking through them. And you can see how Scientology treats. If, if, if Aaron or I speak out about Scientology, they get private investigators, they, um, they put tweets, they, do, they set up websites, they do all this other stuff to try to shut us up from saying what's happening about Scientology. Some, and James Barber, he's not a big Scientology celebrity. He's, he's almost like, who? Like that, that's the kind of thing when you hear about him. For this guy, they find out he had an assault. He's been on the cover of the Celebrity Center magazine or something. They find out he's involved with some uh, assault of an end, underage, uh, of a minor. They get him not one, not two, I think three lawyers. Like they're, uh, you know, Eric Lieberman makes about $5,000 a week from Scientology. He's just on a full-time retainer for the last 30 years. And then he gets paid big money if he shows up. He's on the case. That Wagner lawyer's on the case. All these guys, they're trying to hook him up with the best lawyer they can in New York and maybe in Los Angeles. And he just committed a crime. <laughs> it's the most yeah. bizarre. Th like it, now, it's what's like incredible how is that if James Barber were to leave Scientology and start doing some YouTube videos, all of a sudden Scientology would create a website about what a disgusting pedo criminal he is. Yeah. But as and it, and they and they'd list out all the other ones that they've known about for 20 years that nobody else knows about in the you know in the press or law enforcement or whatever. I think between there's multiple documents on him, but I think between those handful of documents, it it looks to be there's between three to five additional victims that were underage 
that he confessed to. And each time they asked him, a little bit more came up. But this was all happening in 2006. I don't think he actually got convicted or went to jail until 2008. He was actually Correct. out on bail, just walking around doing his thing. Yeah. So. And it's then he crazy. only did 60 days in jail because he pled to a lesser charge and all this kind of stuff. He did only did 60 days in jail once he was sentenced with three years probation. Um, and even the 60 days, I wonder if he served the full 60 days. I don't but, think you know, he did. I think he was in there for like 20. I think it was either 18 or 28 days or something like that. Yeah. But check this out. Something just occurred to me that honestly had never really occurred to me before. You, you know that I always poo-poo any idea that um, people stay in Scientology because they're being blackmailed. Because that's just not how it usually works. But let's take let's use James Barber as a case study. So no one's officially threatened him or blackmailed him most likely. But no, since James Barber knows that Scientology knows that he's guilty of so much more than he was actually found guilty about in a court of law. I could not in a million years imagine James Barber leaving Scientology because they do have the dirt on him. Well, they you're do. you're one hundred percent correct. It's not that they it's not that they um well when we when you leave, when we leave, I mean, to be honest, like they're coming after us, they're coming after you, they're coming after Mike, Claire, whoever. Um, well we know we grew up there, we lived there our whole lives. So what are I gonna say like what, what we were we we were, we were raised by you guys so whatever you say is sort of like okay yeah that happened when i was there you know all about that um but they're coming after us with cracker licking and you know craziness so but if you did get up to some nonsense that you could go to jail for they 100 percent know about that because when you're doing your counseling and you're doing all these different things um, when the meter says you're not giving up the goods, you keep giving it up and giving it up and giving it up until you get something really juicy. And usually that's, uh, something that you could probably go, it, it would be, there would be repercussions somehow in your personal life. Yeah. So, uh, I would say a majority of civilian Scientologists have given up things, e even if not like jailable or, or criminal offenses, just embarrassing. Like, and usually it's uh, per very personal in nature for the most part. And they make an example out of us that they're using that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and say, the, the, it's obvious they will do it if pushed. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying here is I'm almost changing my tune here is like, if James Barber were to want to leave Scientology, there's no question in my mind somebody would come to him and say, not necessarily that you have to stay, but if you say one word, we're leaking this information. If you say one snide, uncomplimentary word about Scientology, you're done. Yeah. I would say it's more of a mafia thing. Like it's an understood, it's a, it's, we don't need to have a conversation about it. It's understood that if you leave Scientology, they're gonna they're gonna scrub every file they have for dirt on you, and they're gonna they're gonna send it out there. So yeah. I, I'm pretty sure when you get to our level of SP, which is I think we're at SP level 15. When you get to SP level 15, there's no amount of nonsense that they can throw that's gonna stick, or at least b based on our SP levels, we do not think it's going to stick. Yeah. So whether it I'm does still or not. Yeah, whether it does or not, we're like we're pretty much Scientology Teflon at this point. We are we we're nonstick. <laughs> I'm still holding out for the unreleased SP levels. The, oh no, I'm writing those as we speak. Uh, so we're good. <laughs> uh, okay, Maria de Jesus Gutierrez says purple. Is that because June is World Elder Abuse Awareness Month with purple being the color to symbolize it? Is she referring to our lights? What the heck? I changed mine to purple and you have purple. Did you just change yours? That is not purple. That is blue. Oh, I changed mine to purple. It looks very purple on that wood. You're getting a dual. Um, but I changed mine every month now. Oh. Every month it ticks over. I just put a different color up back there. Oh, yeah. Um, I That light identifies as blue. As yeah. blue. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my, all right. Mine is purple. Whether no matter what it identifies as, it is purple. Uh, Billy Tulipin SPTV should create its own shortenings. Divige. For example, Davige. <laughs> Davige. What is short? Create its own shortenings. What is? Oh, oh, like um, um, contractions. 
Well, like, uh, what is it? You know, um, contraction, <laughs> like, isn't no, like, no, no, like, uh, shortenings, like, um, uh, what's it, J, uh, J Law and, uh, or what is uh, J Lo and oh. Ben Affleck? Like, uh, what do they call that when they mix oh, them? Oh, they, they're a couple names, Benji, or you know, whatever. I get it. <laughs> they're uh, saying, Benifer, like, Benifer. Benifer, there you go, Benifer. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't get enough, I don't read enough gossip columns to know all the latest things. Okay, so I Devige, do know ScarJo. <laughs> Devige is uh, David Miscavige. De yeah. Devige. Okay. Devige. I get it. Uh, Jeff Hawkins says, "Ah, the films. I was in TR five. I wonder if they've reshot it. They haven't reshot it, but they have replaced any footage with SPs in it with digital um, non SPs." Um, I remember Jeff Hawkins in this film, TR5, YTRs. The main, the, we should do a whole series about the films at some point because the main character in TR5, uh, YTRs, there's actually two co stars. There's um, Isaac Hayes. And he's also in space on a space platform, floating space platform, which now that I think of it has its own atmosphere um, because he's just sitting there talking and we're in the middle of space. Um, but it's not connected to anything. It's just a in a sphere uh, like a platform in space um anyway um and the other guy was johnny, johnny lewis, lewis. Yeah. johnny lewis um newsflash also killed somebody in real life not in the movies uh he had he was an a also a scientology actor or an actor who was a scientologist and um they had so they had to redo all of the scenes with him um, either reshoot them or digitally um, get rid of them. And and just as a note, um, they did end up reshooting or digitally remastering all of the Scientology films because they were filled with people that used to be in Scientology that then left Scientology and were declared SPs. And um, so now their policy is to not shoot with anyone who may even possibly become a Scientologist because the end product of Scientology is leaving Scientology. Yeah, it's also even crazy to think about it now that they would put so much time and effort into reshooting a film just to remove someone's face when you're like, no one knows who that person is. Yeah. No one watching those films today would even know who that person is, but you're going to replace it anyway because you've got nothing better to do, really. Well, arguably, um, Jason Begay is a big TV star now and has a TV show called uh, Chicago PD, and he is maybe one of the uh, most used actors that we shot with him and there's a, a uh, this guy Jack Armstrong and Tate Rupert and Jim Messiman and Larry Anderson and, and Larry, Larry Anderson, Anderson Carla yeah. Zamudio we were using these actors in Los Angeles because they were they were good actors and they were willing to do it in some cases for no fee not in Jason's case he want he wanted his money no matter what we did he, he had a very high rate um, but um but yeah, they, uh, I want to say, besides Jack Armstrong, I, even Alan Barton, Alan Barton was another one. He was the head of the Beverly Hills Play. I think he still might be to this day the head of the Beverly Hills Playhouse, uh, like the one who runs the joint. Um, but um, they were all Scientologists who've now left Scientology and have nothing to do with it. Right. Okay, Fabian and Deal. With handling the pervs over to the cops, Scientology should portray themselves as a civilized, ethical, righteous org. Um, they may also what? They may use Masterson, but maybe attract they may other lose. rich. They may lose the Masterson oh. clan, but may attract other rich, non-educated people like Grant Cardone. All righty, <laughs> rich, non-educated. Uh, oh, we shot with we shot with Grant Cardone there too. Yeah. <gasps> And Still when he story was, another time. <laughs> yeah, when he was getting sec check, lots of things came up. Yeah. I bet. I bet. Um, Joanne McDevitt, watch Danny Masterson try to appeal his case using brainwashing by the Scientology using this film as proof he's been taught this by them. I doubt it. <laughs> no. Um, Bitcoin motorist. Is Michael Wiseman related to Back to the Future 2 actor Jeffrey Wiseman? I'm I don't think so. Okay. Valerie Boljack, I've learned something from all of you. The rule of thumb for identifying a cult or toxic relationship, can you question, includes dictatorship, you name it, that is the red flag. All right. Yeah, another identifier of a cult is when you try to leave, what happens? <laughs> 
Yes, indeed. Cinnamon whiskey. If an auditor leaves Scientology and has copies of admitted child pedo sec checks, why wouldn't they go to the FBI and say there's hundreds more so they could raid Scientology and prosecute many for child trafficking? It's not a bad idea, but I can think of reasons why it wouldn't work. Yeah. The main reason for that is that those files, the FBI can't look through those files. It's the admissibility of the evidence. Yeah. Those are con- it, those are priest pen- what it penitent. 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 Um, it's basically uh, the religious cloaking blocks them from having to turn over those files. The part where it gets a little sticky is when they write these reports because those reports are specifically not um, in those files. They're in other files, which is kind of like a little bit gray. And yeah. And you know, now that I think of it, in there it was a recent lawsuit where the victim, where um, like let's say one of the Jane Doe's, was able to get their own files um, to enter into the lawsuit, and their own files had those reports and the things that happened in them, and that ultimately is why that case was settled. Uh, settled. Right. Um, another aspect to this is that normal auditors in Scientology do not retain personal possession or custody of the auditing files. Um, Those files remain in the custody of the organization. Now, uh, even a field auditor, someone that like audits people outside of Scientology orgs, those people do have a lot of PC folders in their possession. Now, if someone in Scientology was wanted to be really clever and they were planning their escape, they could absolutely now what whether the authorities could do anything with it or not would remain to be seen they could absolutely start collecting up auditing folders and ethics folders of scientologists they knew had committed crimes against children and you know that evidence could be given over to the authorities now whether the authorities whether it would be admissible in a court of law is a, another conversation um but it doesn't hurt to try you know what i'm saying <laughs> if you're on the inside <laughs> just yeah. don't send them to me <laughs> Actually, uh, oh, you could send them to me. Yeah, I was going to say, you could email me. You could email me. I've got I've got some people I can talk to. But no, but uh, on a serious note, um, another thing that we've been finding out is that this mandatory, there's a thing called a mandatory reporter. Um, and so if somebody who is uh, has a job as a counselor or a nurse or a teacher, um, if they find out something that uh, may be against the law or that something's going on that is a little sketchy and they're a mandatory reporter, they are they have to report this abuse. And um, we've been finding out that um, one of the main abuses that's currently happening in Scientology is elder abuse. So if you have a relative or uh, an elder, anybody over 60 that you haven't been able to get a hold of, um, and you suspect there might be some elder abuse coming uh, going on, e- email us and we're gonna, we can help you uh, navigate h- how to deal with that. Absolutely. Okay, Billy Tulipan saw a woman roaming the Madrid org lobby with a street coat for a suspiciously long time. Could she be staff tasked with making the org look busier? I don't know what a street coat is. It's just a coat that you wear on the street. It's just like, a, she's just hanging out in there basically. Yeah. Um, I would the, say no, the, Billy. She's just probably works there and there's nobody coming in. So she's just wandering around waiting. Yeah, she, got, <laughs> she finished her white glove. She's got nothing else to do. <laughs> Um, Fabian and Deal, can you elaborate on this screaming at people in Scientology? Has LRH put it in scripture? What is the deal with that? Can't that cause engrams? He actually did specifically write a policy about screaming. Uh, it's the flag order that ends with ships stay off rocks because uh, executives yell. And, and the thing is, it, uh, the analogy was you're on a ship and you're heading towards the cliff. Someone's got to scream to get everyone's attention and get the right thing done. This was the flag order. It's not a policy letter, but it's, it's, a, it's a policy letter for Sea Org members. Yeah. And it basically, this is not verbatim, but it ends with ships stay off shoals or stip, ships sh- stay off the rocks because executives yell. I think it's as long, because someone screams. Because someone screams. Yeah. And that's the culture. Yeah, it, there's a lot. I once yelled, Jeff Hawkins, <laughs> I once yelled at Jeff Hawkins so loud that I saw stars and people on the other side of the property heard me. <laughs> I think I might, I, I'm pretty, if I didn't apologize, I'm sorry about that, Jeff. 
And Fabian, <laughs> technically, only physical harm, pain, and unconsciousness can cause engrams. A screaming incident could restimulate an engram, but wouldn't actually be the uh, the basic engram. Unless the person was unconscious when there you go. There when you go. The, the screaming happened, then that might be recorded as the engram. One hundred percent. Okay, Metalhead, what Buster the dog done on RPF? Was it brickwork or painting? Also, did they try to sec check him? You know, Buster never got sec checked, which is not uncommon if you're on the RPF. A lot of times you're just doing the work. And if we get around to the sec checking, we'll get around to it. And that's how you end up on there for 10 years. Um, but yeah, yeah. Buster, uh, Buster was all run or uh, David Miscavige's uh, dog. And he did go to the doggy RPF, which is the same facility where Shelly was sent to as well. There you go. Um, basking in it. With all the current evidence of sexual assault, why doesn't the government investigate Scientology? They have to know and they do nothing. The, the, the answer to that is the more people that report it and the more um, evidence that stacks up and um, is reported and sort of like in Scientology, when the file starts to get thicker, then you then that's when people start the more evidence there is the more likely they are to get lit up or investigated for it um i don't think that i don't want to just say all governments are doing nothing some governments have been very successful in messing with scientology and making it so that they can't uh, expand in their country in the united states i think they really do need us the uh the smoking gun and they need a bunch of smoking guns because of this religious cloaking that Scientology has. Yeah. And also there is a grand jury um, uh, currently still open, a grand jury investigation into Scientology obstruction of justice. Um, it started as an obstruction of justice in the Danny Masterson affair. But I don't know how grand jury investigations work. I don't know. Can, can it can it um, as evidence starts to come up about obstruction of justice in these other sexual assault cases? Could it? Could the grand jury start, you know, looking at those things as well? I don't know how that works, but um, I'm mentioning as at least a possibility. So, um, yeah, yeah. Representative Jackalope, does Scientology stockpile weapons anywhere like other cults? Not just uh, David Miscavige and Tom Cruise going shooting, but like arsenals. I don't know of any of that. I know at the end base they have some guns, but it's not like it's not like a Waco thing or it's yeah. just like not an arsenal somebody Sci Scientology somebody breaks doesn't it. really like the idea of people having guns to be honest wouldn't you say um no i mean we had dog they had uh, killer uh, guard dogs and guns at the end base for a while and i think um when some so i want to say a lawyer a scientology lawyer found out it was like you guys gotta that's not a good look you gotta get rid of those dogs and they kept <laughs> the guns but they got rid of the killer dogs yeah. not a sheeple my mic mug, SPTV crew, t-shirt, and hoodie are here. Very nice. Very exciting. Um, Billy Tulipan again. David is pronounced <laughs> David. David. <laughs> okay, David. <laughs> Zenuked. Do you think that any of the Scientology training films could ever get leaked to the public? It's a miracle they haven't already. Well, and it's not really because they were on 35... <laughs> They were on either 35 millimeter film, 16 millimeter to film, or in a digital encrypted system that I designed that if the file, if the drive is taken out of the computer, it sort of burns down the files. And but if any, te any tech film I see or DFT or tech sec or OES could la launch up a film and just set up a phone with a tripod and bootleg that thing. I can't believe we haven't had bootleg versions of Scientology's technical training films. That's true. That could, if you're on course right now and you're watching our videos, you're gonna get some serious, you're gonna, you could, you could, you arguably could go up three or four SP levels in one video, okay? You send us one of those films and your SP level status is gonna go up. So that's how you raise SP levels is by, um, speaking out on the YouTube, writing a book. Um, it's all there's, there's all, I'll, I'll, I'll codify it. I'll show you guys how it works, but, uh, but yeah. bootlegging, bootlegging the tech films, that's the number one thing you can do to up your SP level. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying break the law. I'm just saying if you happen to have a FaceTime with a film that you're watching for an hour, then, uh, yeah, just yeah. Uh, record it. If you find a bootleg version of a technical training film that fell off of a truck, yeah. you can send it to me at growingupinscientology at gmail.com is all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. 
Um, no, no one's going to be allowed to watch a film now. There's no they, more films. Or they're going to, are they going to get yonder pouches for people when they go into their tech film? They're going to have to put their tech, their phone in a bag if they're I'm not gonna, already doing it. I'm going to get called by the Clearwater Police tomorrow. Yeah, we've received a report from Scientology of you conspiring to hack their computer systems again. <laughs> yeah, we're like. No, we we ask people to video, uh, fa have a FaceTime. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, Elizabeth Marino, Scientology kind of does create pedos because statistically most never offend. But in Scientology, they can justify and get away with it. Same with other type predators. It's possible. Well, yeah, Scientology, the, the largest crime in Scientology is Scientologist on Scientologist crime. That's the most prevalent um, one that goes on because they can't report to authorities. So if you're a predator in Scientology, you've got all these, this whole group around you of, of, uh, of sheeple to prey on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Arnie Van Halen at a Metallica concert in Gothenburg when I saw notification. I can't hear you. Oh, boo hoo. <laughs> wow, Metallica's on tour in Sweden. Yeah, Amazing. why are you not watching Metallica? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate Friend, if an auditor's notes are inadmissible because of priest penitent privilege, then that implies the auditor is clergy. Yes, that's true. If auditor is clergy, then in some states that makes them a mandatory reporter. I know it's a weird thing. It you is. Get, it's I don't such know how a... it works. I don't know how it, it works. This is how Scientology does it. They always play both sides of the argument. If, oh, yeah. we're not tax exempt. We are. What do you do for good? Oh, we have all these. Um, we have all these social betterment groups, Narconon, Way to Happiness. Da, da. Oh, this person died at Narconon. Oh, that has nothing to do with us. We don't, uh, we have, we, Narconon is technology, is a drug rehab based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard. We have nothing to do with Narconon. And you're like, oh, you just said it was your, that's your, ugh. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Dave Owens wants to know, was your David Miscavige Keebler elf ever used in auditing? No, you actually have to have very large dolls. You can't use small. Oh, no, you did not. You have your Somebody own. Somebody sent me this, and look what he's holding. He's got one of the crackers that he made for me. He's got a cookie in his hand? He's got a Ritz. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what we're doing, these are David Miscavige's life-size vintage plush toys. Yeah. Okay. David Miscavige's life-size doll is too small to use in an auditing training. It is. Session. Um, no, you have to use big, giant dolls, like these, these creepily large dolls. And the only reason to use this doll is so that you don't accidentally go in session. You don't accidentally start running the auditing commands. It's the dumbest thing ever, to be honest. The fact well, that they made an entire film about it is even dumber. Yeah, because you are essentially asking the doll questions that a real person would react to, and you would yeah. then start doing okay, doing a let's session. Show them, let's show them how it works. You're you're an auditor training on how to do a sec check, and I'm okay. your coach. I'm your coach, and I'm holding this doll. Okay. And in like, in this or any last lifetime, did you ever make a cracker that didn't have salt on it? Go screw yourself, fat boy. <laughs> I'll repeat the auditing command. <laughs> I don't. I'm not an auditor, so I'm not good. That's at this. Ex that's exactly how this works. Like the the doll is here so that he can look at the doll, and I can pretend like I'm not in an auditing session and just role play. That there's a whole freaking film about yes. using dolls in auditor training and they're big they're it? at least five times as big as that doll like yeah, it's like it's like a my buddy doll yeah the throwback to the, the 80s. one in the in the twilight zone that uh it's even bigger than the one in the twilight zone chucky it's like chucky there you go chuck but even bigger probably yeah right they're pretty big yeah um all right that's funny okay kate friend goes and mark went there as i was typing <laughs> okay i don't know what he i don't yeah. know what i said this one was too timely that was nine minutes ago i still don't know what it refers to um okay let me see l went <laughs> do they think of non-scientology children as Satan in small bodies too wondering if they consider abuse of all children the same in or out of scientology that's a great question um the answer is yes they believe it's, yeah all children are are, are yeah Thetans and small. They live, live millions and trillions of lives. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, George. Wait, wait, wait. Jordy. Jordy Angel. Okay. If Scientology were to close its doors tomorrow, what would David Miscavige do? And what would happen to all the money? Would someone blow and take it all? It's kind of a difficult hypothetical because it's so unrealistic. 
Yeah, and it's also that money is all is there's foreign accounts and U.S. accounts, and they have money. They actually was it you who was telling me this about? They had to open up. They have to open up more accounts. Oh no, it was Matt Pesh. Um, we were doing a job, and Matt Pesh was telling me that they had to open. They can only um, whatever the FDIC insurance limit is. Oh right, which is two hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, so when their account get up, gets up to two hundred fifty thousand, they just open another account. That's crazy. Yeah, so they have arguably thousands and thousands of accounts at at, at, at like flo it, if he, this was at Flag, he was telling me. So Flag would have the main account. The re the repayment account, the RPA account, they'd have the the Renos account, the food account, the galley account. They would just open up a new account as soon as uh, the funds were were too big. Wow. All right, Ken's channel says it's too bad they're probably all dead because an interview with one of the sailors on LRH's two ships that he briefly was captain would have to have some good stories. Oh, you're talking about people who served in the Navy with L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Yeah. Those people are definitely most likely not with us. And if they are, they might not remember the yeah. blip, the blip that L. Ron Hubbard was on their radar. Yes. MCMLXXXIII says, you licked the fudge off the biscuit. Don't play. <laughs> <laughs> I had to star that when I thought it was hilarious. <clears throat> That's funny. Uh, thank you for the super sticker, Roxy. Tools and stuff. Recently found audio of L. Ron Hubbard singing. It's amazing. He sounds like the narrator from How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, it's, also not, it's also not. Thank you for listening. Yeah, that's heavily edited and synthesized, right? Yeah, we based the hell out of that thing. <laughs> I mean, there's more auto tune on that thing than a Justin Bieber song. It doesn't. It, it's it's so bad that it really doesn't sound like it. <laughs> like when you heard it, you were like, "Whoa, that's not yeah. the way he sounds in the lectures. That's not the way he sounds in when he's talking. How yeah. could he sound that way when he's singing?" Right, right. Um, right. He was actually a horrible audio uh, mixer, recordist, everything. He was just just horrible at it. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard. Maria de Jesus Gutierrez, seniors are a protected class. Elder abuse then triples penalties if victims are over 60 years old. One felony in California equals three, as in strikes, yes. including financial. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so if you have somebody in Scientology or you're a, rel a relative or anything like that that you're not able to converse with and you are not, you don't know if they're being treated well, if it's a very, very uh, high likelihood that if they are in Scientology as a Sea Org member and they're over 60, that credit cards have been opened in their name, they've been moved off to a retirement home or, or, or some kind of communal living situation, and, um, and they're being taken advantage of. There's very high probability. Yeah. Uh, Ken's channel. Sorry, stories about him yelling. Imagine the yelling when he dumped all of his depth charges on a non-submarine. Oh, yeah, okay. So stories of L. Ron Hubbard yelling in the Navy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you get those stories in Scientology, so. Yeah. <laughs> Arnie Van Halen says, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, basking in it. Happy to hear Amy says Mike is responding well. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. Um, Christopher Clonotis, how long does the Sea Org have left before they can't carry on with only 5,000 left and still shrinking? They won't be able to cover posts. I argue they're still overstaffed. Yeah, well, they're doing a lot of make work there, like a yeah. lot of make work. Like, and that's the funny thing about it management for a long time. Uh, it management for decades was sending telexes and writing programs and all this stuff. And then Elron or not Elron, David Miscavige threw them in the hole and they stopped doing all that. And nothing in Scientology changed. <laughs> it just went on like on autopilot and there was nobody running them. And not, to this day, I don't think anybody's really running them. They're just doing their thing. And um, David Miscavige is micromanaging the whole thing himself. So, yeah, they already have they they have too many staff as it is, believe me. Um, okay, Denver Stevo says Denver Stevo found a rare recording of Elrond Hubbard reading OT3. Check it out over at my place. There you go. Check out Denver Stevo's channel. It's yeah. called Denver Stevo. He's very nasally in that recording too, Elrond Hubbard. Yeah, not like the Road to Freedom album. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bog body. I started writing my book about my childhood in Scientology. Any advice for me? Just uh, uh, make it 
authentic and you and uh and make sure you've got uh um make sure you got a lot of good stories in there yeah um all right so that's all the comments here are you you and claire are doing a live starting in about an hour we are we are we're going to do a live uh, we got all kinds of new stuff we've been working on and uh, we're going to talk about that and, and uh i think we're going to do a q a too Okay, good. I'm going to try to maybe squeeze in another one before you guys begin. If I can time it right, maybe I'll lead into it. We'll see. Nice. See if I can work Appreciate that out. it. Yeah. Um, all right, everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening, uh, this afternoon. Uh, thanks to everyone who watches until the very end, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, yeah, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right